Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, this room is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. All the particles are here. It's a bit strange, but I'll try to uh, get used to that. Before I start, I just arrived yesterday, late flight, arrived late. Um, I just you know, want to get the feeling, how many of you are working on modeling um, projects? How many of you are working on data? Okay, a lot. How many of you are working on hardware? Not, well, kind of, some. And how many of you do pen and paper complicated integral calculations? Oh, OK. So we have a few of them. OK, so we have kind of uh, everything across the stretch. Room. Why don't I start my uh, presentation? Um, just a, a, a quick overview about how I try to build this, uh, this talk. So I'm going to. I'm going to talk about some astronomy aspects um, and then try to take heliophysics stuff and talk about it in the context of what happens beyond the solar system, especially with these processes that uh, you probably heard about um, from within the heliosphere. There will be some repetition uh, from talks, especially about the sun, so I'm going to talk about the solar corona. I'm just not just assume you already heard about it. I will do, try to um, uh, discuss some issues you heard about before, just to put it in a better context um, of this lecture. And the other thing I try to do is to put some um, astronomy concepts, observational concepts, um, in general. Because when I finish my PhD in MHD modeling of the solar corona at the University of Michigan, um, I barely knew what a photon is. And then I moved, I moved to the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I started to suddenly connect with what an X-ray observation actually means in the physical sense. Okay? What a spectra is. What's the difference between photometry, polarimetry, and uh, spectroscopy, and all kind of um, observations we do. There's an X-ray observation, there's radio observation. What does it mean? Why we do the both? What kind of information we get from that? I had complete, personally, I had a complete disconnect from what these things mean, and I think it's very important even for people in the, in the um, heliophysics field to have a better knowledge about that um, because it makes you connect to the actual data you're working uh, with if you're a model. Okay, so uh, there will be stuff like that during my talk, um, which is not purely scientific, but it's kind of overview on uh, these things. Okay, so um, heliophysics, um, the title is Corona, uh, Heliospheres, and Astrospheres. Um, again, it's essentially about extrapolating heliophysics processes beyond the solar system and to estimate or get a feeling how if we change the parameters of the star and this interplanetary environment to uh, conditions that are very different from the sun, what will happen or how it will look like. That's the, the general idea. So the, oops, the outline of the talk, um, in the first part, so it's, it's, it's not going to be two separate lectures. It's pretty much one big lecture that is split into two with a break in the middle. We might take. Um, a uh, two-minute break in the middle of each one of them as well, because these are one and a half lecture um, time, and it's quite long to follow up. Um, so the first thing I'm going to discuss is the solar uh, versus stellar physics, um, or heliophysics versus astronomy. Uh, what are the essence of the differences, um, and why, where do they come from? Um, I'm going to discuss stellar evolution, which is also something that when I finished my PhD, didn't know too much about. Um, some of you may heard about it uh, from astronomy classes you took. Um, it, I'm going to briefly discuss the basics of stellar evolution, because they are important for things that we'll discuss later. Um, and I'll then talk about corona and stellar wind, um, solar and stellar. I'm going to also be bouncing back and forth between terms like solar wind, stellar wind, Solar corona, stellar corona, etc. So everything is kind of mixed together in this talk. Um, then we're going to talk about stellar environments, which are the astrospheres. That's the analogous or the stellar analogous for our own heliosphere, 
for interplanetary space. And then I'm going to move to the, in the second part of the talk to some of the physics motivations uh, for uh, studying heliophysics concept in, ast in, in astrophysics. What are the main science questions, if you like, that people care about that needs this inf information from heliophysics in order to solve these problems? So I'm going to talk about stellar evolution and magnetized winds. Uh, magnetized winds seem to play a role in stellar evolution. Um, but we have some issues of determining how they are in other stars, especially the so-called low-mass stars like the sun, um, M, K, and G stars, in contrast to uh, the giant branch, which are hot stars. They're much more massive than the sun, and they're much more hotter. Okay? So the sun is uh, categorized under the so-called low-mass and cool stars. Okay, cooler temperature, their mass is lower. And uh, we have issues to pretty much measure the winds of these stars, so we don't know what they are. But because they're important for cell evolution, it's important to know what they are, so we need to make this connection between the solar wind and the solar winds. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, solar mass loss rates uh, and stellar spin down. This is the same context, pretty much. Um, at the end, I'm going to talk about solar and stellar flares what they are, where they come from, why they're important. Um, and in general, uh, oh, and finally, I'm going to briefly talk about exoplanets. It's not the main topic of this talk. Um, I know you heard about exoplanets already from Kevin Franz. I think Tran Fei Dong will uh, talk next week. Is that right, Dana? Yeah, so he's probably going to show some uh, work on exoplanets as well. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly towards the end about some of the acts there physics aspects of exoplanets and why we, uh, these might be important for planet habitability um, and just the general understanding of exoplanets. Um, in general, uh, the, most of the material in these uh, two talks uh, comes from chapter 2, 3, and 4 from volume 4 of the heliophysics textbook. Okay, so some of it is based on my original lecture, which was the basis for uh, chapter 4. Um, Chapter two and three were written by Rachel Austin and uh, Brian Wood, um, and I will show some of uh, the topics from these chapters. So. Okay, so part one. Oh, and before we move on, feel very free to stop me and ask questions. Something is not clear, or you just have a question to ask. That's the point of this whole thing. Okay, um, so let's talk about the solar stellar connection. So this is the sun. You've probably seen movies like that. This is an SDO compiled uh, movie of the solar corona in different wavelengths. Uh, and one, it, I think this is five days of data. Maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't matter. Um, the point is that you can see that lots of stuff is going on. Okay? When I first saw an SDO movie like that, I said, I think we should give up. The, sun, the solar corona is so complicated that there's absolutely no way we'll be able to understand what's going on there in a coherent manner. Large scale features, small scale feature, longer time scales, small time scales, different wavelengths which represent different, not different regions in the corona, but different temperatures. Okay? And the different temperatures are embedded within each other. So it's not like one wavelength gives us a picture of one part of the corona. It gives us the, the, the information about the gas that is within that temperature that is represented by that wavelength. But there might be another wavelength data that is kind of embedded within the other one. So things are happening all the time at the same place, within each other, on different time scales and different uh, length scales. So it's very, very complicated. And in addition, there is a coupling between small and large scale. There are things that occur within you know, all these blips, the tiny white blips or bright blips. You know, they occur at time scale, I don't know, a few hours, maybe less even. They're small. But they also interact with these long-term features that are very large and stick around for months or even years which are associated with the solar cycle, 
And this is one of the reasons we still don't fully understand the solar cycle because it requires a, an extremely complicated modeling that couples the small large scale, the long, the, the long term ef effects with the short term effects. Things that happen over the time scale of a year needs to be resolved within the solar cycle, which is the time scale of 11 years. Oh, sorry, I mean, the small scale is the time scale of an hour. So it's very hard to formulate a simulation with the current computing time we have that capture all this high enough resolution to capture all the scales together, okay? And I think, personally, that there's some fundamental thing we don't understand in the solar cycle because it's a very clear and stable signal that we've seen for many, many years, for decades and centuries. Um, but it probably comes from the fact that we have all these things happen at the same time, the same place together. And that makes this problem extremely complicated. Um, but at least in the sun, we have, we can actually capture all these scales together. We have the ability, both in terms of time, a cadence and the, resu the, the spatial resolution, to actually capture that. We know that it's so complicated. We actually see that because we have a very good telescope that gives us full image of the sun and captures all these scales because we also have resolution in terms of the, the wavelengths we observe. We can see many, many different features and get information about them. That's for the sun. The other thing we have in LU physics, and that's the most important distinguished kind of data we have in LU physics, is the in situ measurements. We have spacecraft that actually sit somewhere and take measurements in situ of the gas around them, the plasma around them, typically. Okay? And that's something that we will never have anytime soon in astrophysics. It's the in situ measurements that really make the difference. And of course, soon, hopefully, we're going to have solar probe coming very close to the corona. And ho we hope that these in situ measurements will really, so solar probe should really get into the region where the solar wind is accelerated and the solar corona might be still heated. And we really hope that is that these in situ measurements will really make the difference in our understanding about the process, these processes in the solar corona. Okay? Now, what do we have from stars? This is a very good picture of a star. This is our data, pretty much. Sometimes this is our data. So to some extent, in astrophysics, we have a point source data of the light that is coming from the stars. Okay? And the way we get the information about what's going on in that star is by looking at the light, the specific light that is coming from that star. And think about it, just doing that, how to isolate only the light that is associated with this star comparing to all this background. This is, here in this background, there's not much background light except for the star. But in some situation, there might be three more here. How do you separate the light that is coming from this guy uh, from the neighbors? That by itself is already a complicated uh, data analysis issue to deal with. But then we analyze the light that comes from the star. Oops. Oops. OK. So there are a number of ways to look at the light. And depending on the way we analyze, analyze the light, this will have different names. So the first type of way to look at the light is called photometry. And this is purely measuring the, the intensity of the integrated white light that is coming from that particular star. And it's called photometry. Um, and this is an example from the Kepler data. Uh, the Kepler mission was sent to stare at one particular place in the sky. Uh, close to the center of the, the close to the ga uh, galactic plane, the center of our Milky Way galaxy, um, and it observed within within this uh, field of view, it observed uh, millions of stars, pretty much, and all it did, it collected the light that comes from these stars. Okay, and the main goal was to detect exoplanets around uh, the, the the stars that were in the field of view, but in principle, it just collected the light. So this is a time series of the light. And 
By doing that, for example, we can run a Fourier transform and find some um, uh, dominant frequencies in this time series. And these dominant uh, frequencies can be associated with the P modes, for example, of the star that can be used in astro uh, seismology methods uh, to deduct some information about the star itself, uh, such as mass, radius, uh, rotation periods in particular. So the Kepler data, because, it's re because of its resolution, significantly improved our ability to measure the rotation periods of the star around themselves. Um, and it's done through astroseismology um, techniques. Um, another example of photometry is the well-known transient data that we looked at the star that is, uh, and look at the light that is coming from the star. And if a planet is passing in front of the star, between us and the star, there's a blip in the intensity of the light. These are the blips. This is how the data actually looks like. And then if you zoom in and you look at many, many transients of the same planet and you stack them together, you increase the signal to noise, noise ratio. So this blip becomes more reliable in terms of actual data. Just one rotation or one orbit doesn't, isn't enough typically to make any statement of, of that kind. Uh, but if we get a confident information about this blip um, through models or associated models, we can deduct uh, the distance of the planet from the star, the radius and mass, well, the radius of the star, the mass we need to get to uh, radio velocity measurements, which is a different measurement. Okay? But pretty much these transients, uh, exoplanets, yeah. If, if you need to que ask a question, make sure I see it, OK? Well, that's a good question. So. One of the things these people struggle with is a blip can also occur due to a sunspot that is facing us, because that's a drop in the overall light on the planets. It's, it's a dark spot on the, the, on the star, sorry, and the light of the star will go down. So one of the main challenges for these exoplanet transient uh, people to deduct the actual planet is to demonstrate that this is not a sunspot. And this is why they need many, many orbits that are repeating in a very coherent manner. And they also need some, sometimes more detailed observation on the star to be able to say, this is not a sunspot, this is the planet. Okay, So that, that's a good question. Again, it took, um, this was first done in the, towards the end of the 1990s. Um, it, it's a very non-trivial task to, to do. But nowadays, because we're, we got so experienced with this method, um, people know how to do it very well. So we, we kind of got to the point that um, this process is well known, it's well defined, and, and there's a good way that you can deduct that this is in, indeed a planet. And well, let's keep it for future slides. OK, any other questions? OK. The other thing we can do is what is so-called spectro uh, spectrometry. OK, what do we do then? We get the light from the star. It's a white light. We can actually break it to the particular wavelength. So what we do, each the, the light that is coming from the star is photons, right? Photons equals light. I hope you all know that. Um, and each photon has certain energy that is associated with a wavelength from E equals H nu from quantum mechanics. OK? So we can say there's x number of photons with that particular energy, and therefore they're associated with that particular wavelength. And we can say, OK, that wavelength has certain flux, and the other wavelength has different flux. And this is the, the so-called spectroscopy or spectrometry. You can call it spectroscopy as well, because it's based on the same idea. 
Now, what are wavelengths? Just a quick reminder, because I did it for um, my undergraduate class, and I think it's very useful to repeat. Um, light has different wavelengths. We all know that. Again, different wavelengths are, are associated with specific energy of the photons that carry that particular light. Um, we can also say it's associated with a frequency, which is just the same thing, but we divide or multiply by the speed of light. And we have long wavelengths that are radio. Um, so in terms of energy, it goes low energy in this end and very high energy at this end. Okay? So the low end of the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, to be precise, we have the radio waves. Uh, just to put you in context, um, the, these wavelengths are of the order of a kilometer or mile. It's the same thing for the sake of uh, this argument. Um, it, these are very long wavelengths, okay? The kind of city size, if you like. Um, we then go to a shorter wavelength, which are the size of us, roughly, one meter kind of wavelength. Then we have the microwave um, radiation, about one centimeter. For those of you who speak um, reasonable units and are not from the US, OK? Um, half an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch, something like that. <laughs> but this side, OK? So butterfly is a good example. Um, microwave radiation is the radiation that carries your cell phone signal, roughly, OK? Uh, there's some terahertz frequencies here that you don't care about. Um, we then go to the infrared. Infrared is a good measurement for how cold or hot things are. Okay? Um, in particular, infrared are useful to um, try to observe very cold objects. Okay? So in the context of astronomy, infrared really, really means the coldest low energy emitters in the universe. Okay, that's why we care about infrared radiation. Um, the size is roughly a micron, um, so 10 to the minus 6 meters. Um, uh, cellular uh, objects, uh, organisms, not objects. Um, so like amoebas, uh, maybe the tip of a needle. Uh, actually, the amoebas come here. This is the visible light. It's about 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7-ish. Uh, um, meters. That's the light that we can actually see. Then we go to ultraviolet. This is the molecular size. And when we get to ultraviolet light, we're already talking about stuff that has quite a lot of energy, because these photons carry quite a lot of energy. So in analogy to the infrared, these are things that are hotter, more energetic. And as we go to the ultraviolet and, and the extreme ultraviolet, we start to talk about uh, measurements of the high energy objects uh, or high energetic objects in the universe. Okay? Um, hot corona, black holes, everything that has a lot of energy involved um, will be visible in this kind of range here. So we have ultraviolet, which is with the molecular side. Um, we have EUV somewhere in between here, and then we have the X ray, it's 10 to the minus 10, one angstrom wavelength. Uh, this is the size of an atom. And finally, we have the gamma rays at the far end of the high energy spectrum. This is the atomic nuclear size of the wavelength. So if we see photons of gamma rays, they have to come from something that has so much energy that it's just ridiculous. OK? That's what it means. And that's why gamma ray bursts and gamma ray uh, processes in the universe are so interesting because you need to explain how can you get something so energetic that it emits gamma rays. You need tons of energy to generate a gamma ray. And just as a side note, I was involved in recent very cool observations of gamma rays that come from the solar disk, um, which are extremely energetic. And this is a completely open question. I urge you to maybe Google that and, and try to look at this problem. It's, completely new observation on the sun that was done by a group from Ohio State University. Okay. And as a Michigan alumni, I'm not supposed to encourage you to look at Ohio State University things, for those of you who like football. OK. Um, uh, all these wavelengths, again, as I already mentioned, they can be associated with a temperature. 
And this temperature here is pretty much the temperature at which the body will emit mostly in the associated wavelength of frequency. Okay? So you can see that radio waves and microwaves are associated with emitters that are one Kelvin, one degree Kelvin. So extremely cold stuff. So we use these to observe, you know, the edge, far edge of the universe that is extremely cold. It's at the verge of the absolute zero, pretty much. The atoms there, or the, the particles, are almost not moving, okay, in the thermal sense. Um, and again, infrared, we're talking about, about uh, 100K uh, objects visible, 10,000K. This is the kind of the photosphere uh, chromosphere temperature, just to put you in context. Um, temperature of a upper, the temperature of the upper at, uh, atmosphere of a, a regular planet, like the Earth, or plants in the solar system, will be around the hundreds degrees Kelvin. So it's things that are slightly hotter than, than planets, if you like. Um, and they're actually hotter than, than, than the cool stars, if you like. Um, and then when we go to this high energy re region, you're talking about millions of degrees or more. So like the solar corona, everything that we observe pretty much in X-ray in the universe means it comes from a very energetic and very hot gas or plasma. And this is why it's important to understand the solar corona heating because probably the same process occurs everywhere we see an X-ray photon coming from. Any questions about this? Because this is important. OK, let's move on. So we can do uh, spectroscopy or spectrometry observations. We break the light into the individual wavelength. Then we can stack together the intensity or the amount of photons, or the flux, you can call it. It's all the same as a function of wavelength. And this is what we call transmission spectra or spectra. Um, and it gives us information, detailed information about the particular light we observe with respect to the breakdown of the wa dominant wavelength. So this is a solar spectra. As you can see, and you shouldn't be surprised, the dominant flux comes from the visible range, right? Because we know that the solar flux is dominated by the visible range. That's why our eyes were adapted to mostly see in these ranges. It's not coincidence, right? If we would live next to an M dwarf star, this whole thing would be shift, to, sorry, would shift to the right to a, lower, a, lo a longer wavelength. So we could probably see more in the infrared, maybe, uh, region, OK? So it's all kind of makes sense why we are the way we are, right? Especially in the eyes. And by the way, again, a nice side note, I urge you to learn a bit how the eye and the brain works in terms of um, the way we see. There's no computer or signal processing super sophisticated method that can even get to like 1% of the capabilities that our brain process the signal that we get. It's like super complicated. It's like the most complicated wavelet, Fourier, and all the transforms you can think of together in real time. OK? So we have the visible at the peak, um, infrared and uh, longer wavelength here. There's some radio stuff here that we don't really see at all. Um, this is the high end of the spectra, the UV and X-ray. You can see it's lower flux, but because it's high energy, of course, it's there, right? Um, and when we look at the spectra, we can start to see or to think about the context of, or the physical context that makes this particular emission, right? Why does the sun emit mostly in the visible? Because if you match this spectra, a black body radiation of a body which roughly 5,000 Kelvin temperature, this is what you're going to get. Okay? So the solar photosphere has a temperature of 5,000 Kelvin. And that's where most of this light comes from. Therefore, the black body radiation will match this part. 
But then you have this feature here that don't match this ideal black body radiation. So you need to start to explain, OK, why we see this x-ray here and why we see this x-ray UV here. And then we start to see, OK, this needs to come from much harder places. And nowadays, we know that the corona is not 5,000 degrees, it's a million degrees. And that's where this light comes from, from the corona. Okay? So the spectra provides us a lot of information where the lights come from. And the challenge on the theoretical level is to explain what kind of light the source emitted. But we also need to account for all the radiative transfer processes on the way um, that eventually bring us this observed flux. Okay? So this is, in general, a radiative transfer problem that involves both we need to understand the light emission, and then we need to understand the light propagation to us through some kind of a medium. And many things can happen to the light as it passes through the medium. And we're going to talk, mention that this stuff uh, later in the, in the talk. OK? Any questions? Moving on. Um, so uh, this is just another example of spectra. Uh, this is an air, typical air spectra. It's not, it doesn't cover the whole uh, uh, wavelength. Um, of course, for the Earth, we have much more detailed spectra. And here we're going to we start to talk about resolution that we can actually observe. So spectral resolution is how well we can uh, separate all the wavelength in our signal. And you can see when we move to stellar uh, astrophysics or stellar astronomy spectra, you can see that sometimes we can't really see any features because we just don't have the resolution in our telescope to separate the different wavelengths from each other. We can stack, OK, we can separate that wavelength and tell it has x flux, and then the other one it has y flux and stack them together. We don't have the resolution to separate the wavelengths as well as we can for an Earth observation. And just for reference, we have Venus and Mars. You can see this um, uh, drop in all of them. Right? And this line represents the CO2. Okay? So we know that CO2 has associated wavelength because CO2 has a certain size of the molecule. So if the light will pass through a medium with molecules with certain size, the wavelength of that associated size or the wavelength that is close to the size of that molecule will be blocked. Right? And we see these drops in the spectra. So that identifies, in this particular case, CO2 as a dominant molecule in that medium. Okay? And this is the most important information we can get from the spectra. We have emission lines that the light, as it interacts with the medium or with particular molecule or atom, it actually emits a different photon and we know about this process, OK? So we'll see that line. We know that process occurs as the light passed through that medium in order to get to us, OK? And similarly, we can get these drops that we can say there's that molecule blocked the light. And all these lines are known. So that's the main thing to remember. We pretty much know all the possible lines that can happen to a light as it's passing through a medium and reach our telescope. Okay? So if we build a spectrum and we see particular features both going up or down, it goes up, it calls a mission line. Okay? If it drops, we also know these lines. And because we know about all these lines, if we build a spectrum and we see these obvious features, we can say, this is that line, this is that line, and line. I mean light of a certain wavelength. Okay? So spectroscopy, it's an extremely powerful tool to get information about the medium and the emitter of the, the, the light that we observe. Um, just to briefly, uh, I'll do it quickly. So we have some uh, telescope dedicated for different things because uh, we can't observe all the spectrum in one instrument. It's pretty much impossible to do. So we have dedicated telescopes that observe 
parts of the spectrum in different wavelengths. Okay? So the first ones we have is so-called radio, radio telescopes. Um, they observe in the radio wavelengths. And even in the radio wavelengths, we have dedicated radio telescopes that observe in this part of the spectrum, radio spectrum, and we have others that um, go to different wavelengths. And in particular, we try to get uh, observations of very low frequency, the lower end, end of the radio spectrum. Um, and there are, there are only a handful of uh, telescopes that can actually do that. And of course, the lower we get, uh, the better information we can get about really, really cold or weak processes in the universe that the signal is really, really weak. That's the, that's the goal. And in addition, we have a problem that these are mostly ground-based telescopes. Um, we cannot observe from the ground anything below um, 10 megahertz. Anyone has an idea why? What? Why is that? What happens to a signal, an electromagnetic wave as it passes the ionosphere with lower frequency than 10 megahertz? Well, what does the ionosphere do to this signal? It bounces it back because that's the plasma frequency of the ionosphere, right? That's how we, we, we actually learn to utilize the ionosphere to bounce back radio signal and transmit it around the world, right? Um, so yeah, everything under 10 megahertz is impossible to observe from the ground. That's why people are talking about putting a radio array on the moon, because we can observe lower frequencies. Um, OK, I think we have time. I probably need to speed up. Um, James Webb's telescope, this guy that eats all the money from everything that is funded by NASA. And in particular, for the heliophysics community, we don't care too much about the science, so it's bad. Um, it has been delayed again. Eventually, I think it will fly. But uh, James Webb, or Webb, sometimes it's referred, as, it's referred to as Webb. Uh, it's going to observe in the infrared light. There's another older telescope, Spitzer. You might have heard about it, also observed in the infrared. Um, SDO, NIA, uh, it's a UV instrument. Observe the sun in the UV, UV frequencies. And the EV instrument is looking at X-ray. We also have a few other uh, X-ray solar telescopes, like Yoko. Um, and GOES, uh, the GOES satellite observe the integrated flux from the sun in the X-ray bands. Um, and then we have Fermi that observes um, gamma rays, very high end of the spectrum. And Chandra is a dedicated X-ray telescope to observe, um, oops, to observe uh, X-ray phenomena in the universe that are not solar. Okay, so that's I wanted to briefly mention these uh, instruments, and. One of the reasons we care about all that is that we, I mentioned before, in the Kepler mission, um, the Kepler mission found thousands of planet, ident you know, confirmed planets um, in the universe. We now know that pretty much every star in the universe should have at least one planet, which makes the question, what is the likeliness of finding an Earth-like planet around an M a G star like the sun? It's pretty much 100% right now. We don't have a quantitative way to demonstrate that. But if you just look at what we know about planets, yeah, there must be a, a, a planet like the star, like the Earth. Um, it's a different question where, whether we can find life there. It's a different question where, whether we can find intelligent life there. But that's a, completely out of the scope of this talk. But exoplanets are the driver for the interest of planetary science within the astronomy community. And it's actually a very good thing because um, as a result of the exoplanetary research, um, people in astronomy and astrophysics really started to pay attention to planetary science and heliophysics research. And also it built um, funding opportunity for interdisciplinary research that combines both uh, disciplines. So it's actually a very good um, result of uh, the exoplanet in the context of the interests of the heliophysics community. Okay. Okay, so solar physics, just briefly. Uh, what we have, we have high resolution. I only realized I, I talked only about the first topic out of all my topics, so I really need to speed up. Um, 
We have high resolution global observations, um, high cadence. So cadence is the frequency of the time we take the pictures or the images or the data. Uh, it's high frequency. Um, so we don't take one picture per year and base all our information about that. We take few pictures per minute sometimes, so obviously we can capture the time evolution better. Uh, we have multi-wavelength observations, also with high resolution, and we have in situ observations. Um, so we can have a detailed and constrained models uh, to build upon to explain the sun and space physics. And, but the caveat is we have information only about one star or one planetary system, if you like. Okay, so that's the caveat in heliophysics. In astrophysics, in contrast, we have statistical information of many stars, right? So we can place our own sun somewhere in this uh, domain of parameters that we can study. Um, we have data on different spectral types of star. This is the terminology for different stars and their type. Okay, so we say spectral type. We mean uh, different kind of stars from M, K, G, F, um, A, B, and O. And we can also have data on stellar evolution. So the sun is pretty much a snapshot in time in terms of this, this, the, the evolution of the sun. Okay? The sun is 5 billion years old. It will live for 5 billion more. And then stuff will happen. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Um, but the current sun, what we see is just a snapshot of that long evolution. And we have uh, information about some planetary systems. So we see a zoo, uh, that, that, that movie I showed you before, pretty much shows a whole zoo of planetary systems that we can have. A planet system with one gigantic planet very close to the star. We can have systems with 20 or even 30 planets. Um, it's, it's, there's a whole spectrum of the type of planetary system we see in contrast to their solar system, which just, again, it's just one example that we studied the guts of, but it's just one type of solar system that could be, we could find in the universe. And we have limited knowledge about the specific parameters of the parameters, and we have limited knowledge about their winds and environments. This is due to the lack of data. So just to summarize, the sun is one data point that we have a lot of information about, and then stars can give us the statistics that we don't have about the star or about the sun, and our goal is to combine the two to get the most of our understanding about uh, these things. Um, and of course, we have unconstrained models because we don't have enough data to constrain the model, as simple as that. And it, it, I'll be happy to talk with you about uh, this aspect during the break. I don't have a dedicated slide for that, but if you're interested in that, you can talk more. Um, let's talk about stellar evolution, and we'll do it quickly. Um, this is the HR diagram. How many of you have seen that before? In the class context, not in a Google context? OK, good. Uh, it pretty much shows the standard evolution of stars, uh, depending on their type. This axis shows the, the, the temperature. Um, low temperature here, high temperature here. It also represents the mass. So low mass stars here, small stars, big stars on the left. And this shows the luminosity. It's the total light that comes from the star, the stellar flux of light, if you like. Okay, So very high flux, very low flux. And you can see we have the M stars here. They're very low mass and faint. We have the K stars, orange. M stars are red. Um, K stars are red. These are the G stars. Our sun is somewhere here. This is, well, yeah, this is the sun. Um, still low mass, but more bright. Uh, about 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin on the photosphere. We then go to A stars, white, um, greenish, blue stars, and purple stars or violet stars. And then we have the supergiant branch, giant and supergiant branch here, which are the later stage of the cell evolution. I'll talk about this in details. And we have white dwarfs here. Um, and these are the, this is the region where what we call the pre-main sequence. So 
when the star is still evolving to their steady state situation, they're around here. We then have the main sequence stars that are kind of operate in a steady way along this line. This is the post-main sequence stars that um, towards the end of their life, they'll be here. Now let's talk in more details about everything I just mentioned. Um, stars are born in this uh, uh, interplanetary mediums of hot gas that starts to collapse uh, gravitationally to clumps. And these clumps starts to rotate around the center of mass um, as a result of like the genes instabilities and stuff like that. So stuff starts to uh, rotate around and can, becomes a kind of a thinner disk uh, close to the equatorial plane around the spin of uh, rotation, the axis of rotation. And stars, uh, the material starts to collapse towards the middle due to the gravitational uh, force. Eventually, most of the stuff will be collected in the central body, which will be the star. What is the percentage of the mass in our solar system that is in the sun? What? Just throw guesses. It's actually almost everything. It's like 98 or 99. OK? So most of the material will go to the star. Now, what drives stars in general? For those of you who took the classes in astronomy or something like that. Exactly. So at some point, the material will collect, be collected in the middle. Gravity will become harder and harder. So stuff wants to be collected through the middle. It will exert a pressure and increase the temperature in the middle. And eventually, the temperature will be high enough, that's around the 50 million degrees, I think, um, to drive nuclear fusion of uh, pretty much hydrogen atoms. These are deuterium and tritium. Uh, this just show the exact process. Uh, we take two hydrogens, fuse them together to get a helium atom. There will be an excess of energy that will generate heat. That heat will exert pressure that pushes out. Okay. And then the star will become a steady state. Oh, and in general, the heavy products will sink in, into the middle. Okay, So through the uh, process of fusion, the lighter element that we fuse will create a heavier element that is the product. And that element, that heavier element, will go to the middle. That's kind of a, an important thing to remember. Okay, And we'll have an excess of energy. So a steady state star will have gravity pushing in. And this heat that is the result of the excess of energy of the fusion process pushing out. And we get a steady state. We're burning hydrogen in a fusion matter. Um, we create heat that pushes outwards. And that is enough to hold the gravity from pushing more. Okay? And this is a star in the steady state. And this is what we call a star in the uh, main sequence stage. That it burns its internal material in a steady matter, and that burning is enough to hold the gravity from making everything to collapse to the middle. So that's the main sequence star. What happens to the post-main -se uh, post sequence stage? Um, at some point, we run out of hydrogen atoms to burn in the middle. So we run out of force to hold gravity from collapse, right? That's pretty much what will happen. So uh, let's talk first about mid-sized planets, uh, stars, sorry. Um, all the different processes and what distinguish the stars from one another or the types of stars, stellar type, spectral type, is the mass, the initial mass of the star, OK? So if we have low mass stars that started from smaller regions and smaller mass, certain path will happen. So this is low to mid-sized stars. If we have high mass stars that have much more mass to start with, it will be a different path. And these are the giant branch um, uh, high mass stars, hot stars, also known as. Okay. So for mid-sized star, uh, stars, um, 
once they, they finish their, to burn all their hydrogen, they'll start to inflate, actually, and become a red giant. Okay? So due to this uh, process of getting out of equilibrium, because you have to conserve energy, and I don't want to get into details about the process, their envelope will start to inflate. They're going to head you're going to have a core that becomes more dense because of gravity, but the outer layer will start to inflate and we'll get a, a red giant uh, star that is fainter than the original star, but it's much bigger. And this is uh, when we finish the H. Uh, and we're still going to have some hydrogen burning at the, the, these outer shells. Okay? And the red giant phase, we start to burn helium uh, with a, a neutral HL, or just non-burning hydrogen shell, OK? And then we get to the asymptotic giant branch phase, where we, start, we can't even burn helium anymore, OK? Remember that the heaviest stuff sinks to the middle. So we burn light stuff, create heavy elements, it goes to the middle. Then we run out the, of the light stuff, and the core is condensed, gravity, the pressure increases, the temperature increases. We have now, now we have higher energy or enough energy to burn the, the heavier material. Okay? So we start to burn that. That runs out, goes out, but the heavier product of the new burning will again condense. We increase the temperature even more, we start to burn that thing. So in mid-sized planets, we're going to get all the way to burning uh, carbon and oxygen in the core with a hydrogen and helium shell. And eventually, when we run out of these guys, uh, we cannot create higher temperature to burn the products that are of this material. And then we have an explosion, a, a complete collapse of the gravitational potential. There's nothing to stop the gravity from collapsing into the middle. Um, and the product of that, the, the outer shell was just going to blow up in space. And we're left with a planetary nebula, which uh, is all the gas that blew up, was blown into space around. We have a very bright core in the middle. That's the planetary nebula stage. But then that core starts to cool off because there's no source of energy anymore. It becomes a white dwarf. And eventually, all the energy runs out. It's completely cold. This is what we call black dwarf. And this will be the end of our own sun. And this slide just shows this path. We start with the nebula, moving to main sequence, giant plants. Uh, this is the post-giant branch. And then this is the planetary nebula, and then the white and black dwarf at the end. Now, so this is the post. Uh, what happens in, in massive stars, stars that have really um, lots of mass to start with? This is a more interesting thing. Um, there's a chain reaction of exactly what I studied about. The lighter elements are burnt, creating new material that is heavier, sinks into the middle. We're running out of fuel of the lighter element. The core collapses, temperature increases. We start to bend the heavier element. And then it goes on and on and on. But because the star is much more massive, we, uh, the, step in th the steps in this change are longer. So this is pretty much what I just described. And Right before the end, we have this onion-like shell of the, the elements, starting with the lighter element out, hydrogen, helium, carbon, uh, neon, oxygen, silicon, and iron in the middle. But there's not enough mass in any star that can fuse uh, iron. Therefore, eventually, the iron uh, the, the, the silicon burning will end. We cannot infuse the iron in the middle, so there's nothing to stop the gravitation co gravitational collapse. We have a supernova explosion. Okay, and this is where even heavier elements are created. So all the heavier all the elements in the universe that are heavier than iron are created through this explosion of the supernova. So everything is collapses. There's so much energy involved in this very fast process. Think about it. It's a stellar lifetime. And it takes about 
few days for this stuff to occur. And the collapse itself is, is really quick. It's pretty much in, instantaneously in, in terms of stellar evolutions, right? And that's where all this energy collapses and transforms into creation of heavier elements. Um, and these heavy elements are spread by this explosion. And these elements made us eventually. So we are made out of stars. You know, typical thing. Yeah, Lika. This, the temperature, the, 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 as the core collapses, the pressure increases, and the temperature associated uh, that is associated with that is not hot. It's not high enough to infuse the, the iron. That's why it's why it stops. You don't have enough mass in any star to create high enough temperature to infuse the iron. It is interesting. Yeah, there's some nuclear, I'm not an expert on nuclear physics, but there's a detailed nuclear explanation, nuclear physics explanation for that. Let, let me just finish this because this is the best part. What happens afterwards? And I really want to move on because I realized I was talking too slowly, so trying to speed up. Um, depending on the initial mass of the star, uh, that explosion will strip everything from the nucleus of the atoms in the core we leave only neutrons. So you strip the proton out, you're left only with neutron with a neutron. This is a neutron star. And if the mass is not too high, this neutron, uh, in order to infuse the neutrons, uh, you have a pressure of the neutrons. They, they don't want to be infused, so they push back. And in the case of neutron stars where the mass is not too high, that pressure is sufficient to hold the the, the further collapse of the, the, the gravity, OK? But if the mass is too high, even that cannot be sustainable. And we're left with a black hole, which is this singular object that the laws of physics can't really explain um, to some extent. Um, so these are the two ends, potential ends of massive stars. Um, and that's how they end. So yeah, it's a, well, let's do one more. Quickly. Um, this slide just summarizes everything I discussed, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, one thing I just want to mention is that there's a significant internal structure difference between different stars. Um, the red branch has a fully convective, um, it's a fully convective star. So the convection zone between the core and the photosphere extends all the way from most of the stellar. Uh, Radii. Okay? Sun like stars, so these are KG and maybe A stars, have an internal core, they have a radiation zone and a convection zone at the outer layer. And massive stars actually have a convective core and an extended radiation zone. So massive stars, what their, their outer uh, parts are dominated by radiation in contrast to low mass stars that their outer part are dominated by convection. And this is significant in the context of the generation of the magnetic field that we mentioned, going to mention later. So let's uh, make a stop here, and we're going to let's maybe take two minutes break. There's, there's some unique you know, atomic situation with iron that, that prevents the, this cycle to move on. Yeah. Yeah.
that's why in supernova when form you element supernova energy so that is again yeah. second number right it's it's the top what <coughs> a bit more yeah, I think if people are missing it okay why don't we start and let the people Show up. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, corona in general and stellar corona and winds. And some of it is a repetition of stuff that you probably heard, of, heard about already, but I wanted to kind of repeat some of it just to be on the safe side. Uh, let's start with hot stars. These are the easy ones. We're going to just briefly describe them. Um, 
Hot stars, um, and as I mentioned, their envelope, their outer envelope, is dominated by radiation. Okay, and they're really, really hot. Um, the surface temperatures of hot stars, um, yeah, ranges from um, seven uh, to eight k Kelvin. They can extend all the way to thirty k at the surface. So significantly hotter than the sun. Yeah, question. This is a, an animation. It's not a real star. Just one that looked like hot star. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have these temperatures on the surface, and um, we have fully radiative envelope. And again, the temperatures can range uh, to these temperatures. Um, and the winds in these stars, they, they're not driven in the same way that our own solar wind is driven pretty much driven by the radiation force. And the winds become supersonic almost at the surface. So there's no uh, acceleration region like in our own corona. Um, and again, there's a radiation, very strong radiation pressure that accelerates the wind. Um, and these winds, the winds of massive stars, are believed to be very powerful. Uh, we're talking about um, something like 10,000 kilometers per second wind sometimes, which just for reference, our own solar wind, the fast wind is about 900. Uh, so it's significantly higher. Uh, and also the mass loss rates from these stars is extremely high. So these stars lose mass through to the winds in a very high rate, uh, about 10 to the minus 6 or minus 7 solar mass per year. Just to put you in reference, our own solar mass loss is 10 to the minus 14. So you're talking about six or eight orders of magnitude higher mass loss rate. Okay? So these stars lose their mass to the wind very fast. And it relates to stellar evolution issues that we're going to di discuss later. Okay? Now, uh, low mass stars, and these are the so called solar analogs or sun like stars. Um, and as far as I see the definition of solar analogs or sun-like stars are cool stars, low mass stars that are relatively cool in temperature and they have hot corona. Okay? And the question is how does the solar corona is heated and how does the solar wind is accelerated has been dis was discussed here. I would like to briefly uh, remind you about that. Um, this is again the same movie from uh, uh, before. Um, these EUV images of the sun or the solar corona indicate that we're looking at temperatures of a million degrees or higher. Um, therefore, the, sun, the corona is really, really hot. Uh, this was known pretty much for the first spectroscopic measurements that people have done on the sun. They've seen the iron um, ionization lines um, that suggest that in order to get such an ionization, you have to have a million degree temperature. There's no way you can... You can produce this ion otherwise. And that's why people started to believe that the corona is really, really hot. Okay? Um, and in general, the coronal heating involved a completely, uh, extremely complicated uh, uh, plasma physics processes that occur between this photosphere, between the surface and the corona itself. There's some kind of runaway effect that leads to a, 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 a heat flux coming up um, and deposited in the upper part in the corona. We believe that it's some interaction of the motion of the magnetic fields and the interacting with the matter, um, et cetera. Um, this is the temperature uh, plot of the, of the temperature of the, the corona as a function of height. We have the chromosphere here. Sorry, we have the photosphere about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. We have the chromosphere that get, is a bit hotter, about 10,000, 50,000 degrees. Um, and then within the transition region, which is an extremely narrow region, um, this whole thing blows off and we get this over a million degree uh, temperature in the corona. Um, we have recent models and observations that starts to converge towards how we think the corona is heated. But there's still uh, 
few distinguished mechanisms, and I don't think there is a, a clear question or a clear answer which one is the dominant one. Um, I'll just briefly describe. We have the so-called AC um, mechanism that involve pretty much waves <coughs> or shaking the magnetic fields. That shaking generates waves that travel along the magnetic field line, and these waves interact with the material and deposit this, the wave energy into heating of the gas. Um, we can have some resonant mechanism that instead of direct uh, the position of the energy, there's some resonance interaction with specific species in the corona, and that can be ions or electrons, and the mechanism will be different, and different frequencies involved. Um, but there's also uh, this kind of view of wave resonance uh, heating. So these two involve waves, or time-dependent kind of shaking of the field lines, and these are the so-called AC mechanism. We also have the DC mechanism uh, that is associated pretty much with magnetic reconnection. Uh, magnetic reconnection is when we push two and opposite field lines towards each other. They, we reshape the structure of the field. There's some dissipation um, process involved in this me mechanism, and acceleration of particles, and heating. Um, and that heat flux can be uh, estimated uh, as a candidate to heat the corona. And there are some models and, uh, that show that we can heat the corona in this way. Okay? Um, Unfortunately, you would think that if we have new instrument with better resolution, we can distinguish between one model or the other, right? But um, we actually have, this is a, a, a SD observations that suggest that this mechanism occurs in the corona. Um, this is a, a work by Justin Casper from 2013 that suggests that the resonance mechanism occurs. And we also have high, re high C uh, instrument, uh, measurements. High C was a, a sounding rocket that was launched and took extremely high resolution pictures of the corona for about five minutes. Um, but uh, these observations show some evidence for this um, nano flares or reconnection mechanism. So we have much better data, but we can still not sure which mechanism is the right one. And I think the way to see it is that, following our state, my statement from the beginning, the corona is so complicated that most likely all these things operate at the same time together. And maybe there are some regions that one mechanism dominate the other, but it seems like all mechanisms occur. So again, it's a complicated problem. Um, the origin and evolution of the solar wind. Um, the basic idea is that the sun sits in space. Space is a giant vacuum cleaner. It wants to suck everything out because it's vacuum. Uh, what's the number density in the interplanetary space around the Earth, roughly? A few cubic centimeters, right? So it's five particles, maybe, yeah, this volume, right? So, and these particles are like protons or you know, small particles, right? So it's pretty much empty space. So this vacuum cleaner wants to suck up all the material from the sun. What holds this material back? Gravity, right? So there's a competition between this pressure gradient force from high pressure here and low pressure here, and gravity that pulls back all the material. But if a particle, for some reason, starts to leave the sun, gravity be becomes weaker and weaker. And at some point, the pressure gradient will win, and that particle will be sucked into space and being accelerated to some as asymptotic speed. This is what we call thermal acceleration, um, or uh, the hydrodynamic acceleration. Um, it was introduced by Gene Parker in 1958, the famous paper. Uh, where he showed that uh, the solar wind is accelerated up to a supersonic point, and then it's further accelerated uh, to some asymptotic speed that should be of the order of 100 kilometers per second. So there should be a radial expansion of the sun with a, of a flow of about a few hundred kilometers per second. Um, you probably heard the story that it was 
extremely um, unpopular idea amongst um, many scientists, in particular astrophysicists, that could not conceive that the sun is not in a static, a hydrostatic equilibrium. And the paper was rejected by three referees, and Parker was lucky to be a, a, a next door neighbor in his office with Chandra Sekhar, who was the editor of FJ, and he asked Parker, do you still want to publish it? And Parker said, yeah, I think it's fine. Um, and it was published. And Parker was also lucky that only three years later, uh, the first solar wind measurements came out with actual spacecraft, and they just showed the solar wind is there. Um, one recent uh, new information about this story I learned from a recent paper by Tomas Gombosi that was really published um, a few weeks ago, kind of summarized the story of the solar wind. I urge all of you to read it. It's really nice. Um, uh, description of the history. Um, turned out that the referees rejected Parker's paper, but apparently there was no obvious reason why. They just said, you know, we think it's wrong, but they didn't state it why. And I think that helped to Chandra Sekhar to uh, make that paper accepted eventually, because there was no clear statement why it is wrong. Okay? So uh, this is from Parker's original paper. You can see that for depending on the base temperature of the on the sun, or in the, the base of the corona, if you like, base of these field lines that the solar wind out, going out along with. Um, this sets the pressure at the base comparing to the pressure at infinity, right? So that's our pressure gradient force. And depending on the temperature, the higher the, the temperature, we can get uh, faster asymptotic speeds of the solar wind. But we know from long-term observations of what the solar wind we did uh, in the last decades, uh, that first, the solar wind is bimodal. We have a cooler, fast component and, and that is less dense. And we have a slow, hotter, and more dense component. This is the fast wind, the slow wind. We also have a very distinguished compositional difference between the two populations. So the solar wind is essentially uh, composed of two populations, and their mechanism for their acceleration is slightly different. We still investigate it on that. Uh, we still investigate on that. Um, we see that the fast wind is faster than the predicted, the one predicted by the pure hydrodynamic model. What does that tell us? If this model cannot explain the full speed of the wind, what do we need? We need additional thing to accelerate even more, right? So it means that this description is not incomplete. We need to explain how we, ha we need to accelerate the wind even further uh, to get the, the, the winds we observe. And finally, we have an inverse relation between the wind speed and the electron freezing temperature. The electron freezing temperature represents the temperature at the base of the wind uh, streamline, if you like, OK? And in this model, the, faster, the higher the temperature, the faster the wind is. But what we actually see is uh, an inverse relation between this base temperature and the wind speed. And this is a problem, again, that we need to explain. And I'm not going to talk about the wind uh, or these models further. But I'm just going to state that this is what we see in reality. And there's some inconsistency between this relatively ideal model. Keep in mind that this model does not account any magnetic field in the process. It's assumed that the flow is along the magnetic field lines, and the field lines don't play any role in energy deposition or acceleration. Okay? And we know that the magnetic field must play a role, so this inconsistency probably comes from the fact that we need to include the magnetic field in our model. Um, just a quick uh, review of the concept of the alpha point, because it will be important for later. Um, <coughs> As the speed accelerate, the wind accelerate from the surface, at some point it reaches a point where the wind speed equals the local alpha speed. And what is the local alpha speed? The alpha speed is defined as b square over 4 pi rho in a, a CGS units. Um, it's pretty much the magnetic pressure divided by the density. And just to have an analogy for those of you who are familiar with fluid mechanics, um, it's the, the, the magnetohydrodynamic analogy for the sound speed, which is the thermal pressure divided by the density. Okay? 
And this is the speed at which information can propagate along magnetic fields. Um, another way to look at that is that we, have this, we can have this collection of these alpha points where the, the wind speed equals the alpha speed, and we're going to call it the alpha surface. It's a surface that collects all these alpha points um, around. Okay, so we have a subalvanic wind within the surface and superalvanic wind outside of this surface. Um, yeah, that's the superalvanic wind. And another thing that will happen in this point is that the magnetic pressure that holds the magnetic loops together cannot withstand the dynamic pressure of the wind that pushes out. So the wind will open up the field line, and we're going to have these open field lines at the alpha point. Okay? So this is the point where these magnetic fields are opened up to infinity, if you like. And we have the concept of an open field line, which is a field line with just one foot point or one end attached to the sun, in contrast to a closed loop, which have two ends attached to the sun. And of course, these field lines must close somewhere at infinity, because we want to obey the dv equals 0 um, empirical law which is part of the Maxwell's equation. OK. Um, the radial uh, solar wind will carry with it the field lines, because in MHD we have the concept of frozen concept. I hope all of you know about this. Um, but because the sign rotates, um, the field lines, the interplanetary field will actually form a spiral um, uh, shape. Um, and this breakup of the field lines can also be seen here. This is a, um, a cutting edge simulation by Knumann and Knopf from 1971. They were actually here at AGO. Um, this is pretty much the first real MHD simulation about this, of the solar corona, when they took a dipole field and they imposed a radial wind on top of that. And indeed, they got this uh, opening of field lines and the, field, the, the fact that the field lines kind of drape out or dra are dragged out. Um, to the, to the heliosphere. Um, the magnetic field of the interplanetary space is described by the so-called Parker spiral equation. This is the equation. And let's just uh, review what it means. Um, so it has a radial component and a azimuthal component, which is this term. So the wind, is red, the wind itself is radial. And the radial wind is represented by this U solar wind. This is the velocity of the radial, radially expanding wind. Um, then the ratio or the, 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 dip, the difference between the radial and the azimuthal component will be dictated by this term, which is the radial speed and the rotational velocity, if you like. This is this term here, omega sun. This is the rotation of the sun. There's also a latitudinal dependence. Um, as well. So if the radial speed is higher, this term will get smaller, and the field will be more radial than azimuthal. Okay? If the rotation is faster, the field will be more azimuthal, because this term will go up. Okay? So this term here pushes towards making it more azimuthal, and this radial velocity make it pushes to be more radial. Okay? And the ratio between them will dictate the radio, the, the azimuthal component of the field. And then we have at the base, uh, this is the magnetic field at the base of this streamline of the wind. Think about 1D streamline or 1D magnetic field lines. This is the magnetic field at the base. And it's assumed that this is the magnetic field at the point where the wind is fully developed. So there's no acceleration or heating done anymore. This is the real wind. Okay. Um, just as a, a, a side note, um, uh, do you know what's the angle of the Parker spiral around uh, 1 AU, around the Earth? 45 degrees. By the time we get to Jupiter, it's 90 degrees. It means that by the time we get to Jupiter, the field is completely azimuthal. Okay, and this is how it looks in 3D. This is for theta equals um, uh, 90 degrees. This is theta, not, this is lo uh, latitude, not collatitude. This is theta equals 90 degrees. You can see that for theta equals 0, this term is 0. So the wind at the pole is fully radial. Now, um, 
the wind expands and fills the interplanetary space. Uh, there's a good chance you've seen this slide before. Um, this is, a, this is a based on measurements that were taken by Ulysses that had an orbital uh, orbit, a, a polar orbit at around 5 AU, which is the Jupiter, the distance of Jupiter from the sun. Um, during solar minimum, you can see it measure a clear two populations of solar wind. This is a slow wind closer to the equator, and it match, it's over plotted with the structure of the magnetic field of the sun uh, at that time when we had a faster wind at higher latitudes here and here. Um, during solar maximum, you can see that the solar magnetic field in the background is much, much more structured, is much more complex uh, with much many features. You can see that the, the interplanetary space is filled with mostly slow wind, which means that it's more dense, it's slower. Okay? And then in the next solar minimum, we start to recover this shape, but then the mission was canceled, or not, not canceled, but completed. So we don't have full observations for that, that uh, solar minimum stage. Okay? But what we can see is that uh, during solar minimum, again, the equatorial solar wind, polar fast wind. Um, this is a lower IMF uh, interplanetary magnetic field uh, state. Uh, in solar maximum, we have multiple uh, magnetic field of the sun. We have mostly slow wind. Uh, it's unstructured. Um, and uh, we have an increase in the IMF, IMF. So the takeaway from that plot is that the structure of the solar wind and the interplanetary space are controlled by the structure of the magnetic field of the sun. There's a full mapping of what the field is close to the sun, and this maps the whole interplanetary space all the way to the end of the, solar, the edge of the solar system. And this is a very important thing to notice when we're going to talk about the stellar context. Okay. Um, okay. We have four more minutes, and then we take a break, a longer break, and then we'll continue. Um, so. One of the questions we would like to ask, and here we really go to the, to the stellar thing, or the stellar context. So how does this relation change in other stars? Okay? And this is pretty much when we start to talk about astrospheres and not heliosphere. So it's how the heliosphere scales for other stars where, which have different parameters at their base. Um, this is the heliosphere. Uh, we have the inner heliosphere, the planets, the solar wind flowing out here. We have the Parker spiral in this region. Then the solar wind starts to fill the interplanetary uh, interstellar medium that is coming from this side. And it slows down to a point where we form a shock, a bow shock, because it becomes super, it becomes subalphenic and subsonic because it slows down. Okay? So in that transition, we have a shock. The ISM is also supersonic here, so it slows down by the solar wind, so we have another shock there. And we have some complicated interaction region between the two here. Um, and we have the Voyager spacecraft that are, at least one is believed to cross the termination shock. Um, this is the data that pretty much shows that. Um, you can see a drop in the solar wind particles pretty much and an increase in the cosmic rays flux. So if we have more cosmic rays and less solar wind particles, it means that we're not in the solar wind, we're out. That's kind of the logic we see here. Um, I think there are two people in the world that still think that Voyager has is, is not crossed the termination shock. Um, at least one of them is at the University of Michigan. He's tall and has a white beard. And the other one is his associate, so you can guess who that is. Um, the argument is that uh, despite of this data, the, there was no clear change in the magnetic field that Voyager measurement uh, measured. And um, that claim makes some people think that we haven't crossed yet the, that boundary. We're still in pretty much. But it's a it's, uh, subject for debate. I think most people are convinced that we're, the Voyager one is out. Uh, bear in mind, it's not a clear region of, you know, it's not a clear boundary, right? It's not the crossing the Mexico-U.S. border, right? It's, 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 a, it's a wide region that moves in and out. So 
maybe there's just no clear transition region that we can say anything. Um, okay, let's briefly move, uh, go through the next few slides and then we'll, we'll take a break. Um, so if we look at the Parker uh, spiral formula, uh, there are two ways that uh, we can change things for other stars. Um, so what is the effect of the stellar rotation? We know that uh, young active stars rotate much faster, and we're going to discuss this more later. Um, the rotation can be up to two days, even half, half a day rotation, in contrast to half, uh, 27 days, roughly, of the solar rotation. So that can have a dramatic effect on the Parker spiral in general. And this is a simulation I did um, in 2012 where um, I took a sun-like star with a dipole field, and I changed the one of the things we, we investigated is that we changed the rotation of the star. Um, and you can see this is a equatorial plane Parker spiral. And you can see that um, the, sp the spiral becomes more compressed as we boost the rotation. And this is the case of the solar corona. So this is 24 solar radii box. And you can see that for the 25 days rotation, the field lines are pretty much radial because it's dominated by the radial component at that distance from the star or the sun. If we boost the rotation up to half a day, and we do have some stars like that, you can still see that the solar corona itself looks like uh, an extremely rough spiral. And that can have some consequences on the winds and the mass loss rate that escaping from the star. Again, we'll be talking about it uh, later. Um, the other effect can come from, well, there, there might be another effect from the solar wind itself, but we don't know what it is to be continued. So let's talk about this field at the base of the uh, field line or the streamline. Um, B is not uniform. We know that the solar magnetic field changes from solar minimum. This is a map, a phi theta latitude, a phi theta map of the magnetic field of the, su of the sun during solar minimum, solar maximum. You can see we have more complex field um, during solar maximum. This is the extrapolation using potential field, which I believe you talked about um, from Pete Riley's paper. This is, this is during solar minimum. We can see it's mostly, the field is mostly dipolar. During solar maximum, we have a much more uh, uh, complex field. Um, so uh, the re this, this change leads to a change in the, this BS component you know, from time to time, and that will change the wind itself. So what we see is that young, active, fast rotating stars seem to have their magnetic field activity concentrated at high latitude. Okay, so this is the same map as before of the sun, but you can see that there's a strong concentration of magnetic field at higher latitudes. And this is something we see in many stars that have really fast rotation. We're not sure why is it so, but you can think of a process that you spin out the star, things tend to move up in latitude. Because these things are driven by, by fluid dynamics uh, or magnetohydrodynamic sense, okay? So the, boosting the rotation can push things up. Uh, this is another, this is from a, this is a map of a star called AB Dor, the young active sun with half a day rotation period. Um, this is from Hussein et al, 2007. Carl Schreiber made some simulations of um, this pumping of uh, rotation, and they show that indeed you can get the concentration of the magnetic field moving up to the poles. Um, so the question is, what's the consequences of this polar concentration um, in terms of the magnetic field? And this is another simulation I did where I took a solar magnetogram, and I pretty much isolated the spots and moved them up in latitude artificially. So this is the actual solar magnetogram. This is the spots moving to, uh, up by 30 degrees, and this is by 60 degrees. You can see now the concentration of the magnetic field, or the active regions, in the polar region, and you can see that the magnetic field um, topology and also the way it will formulate the wind can be very different from here to here. So in principle, any IMF quantities that depends on latitude, that has latitudinal theta dependence should be highly affected by the fact that the, this magnetic concentration 
has moved to a higher latitude. Um, OK, I think this is a good point to stop and take a break. Uh, so let's continue after that from this point. 10.30.